This conference will now be recorded. Thank you so much, Laura. As Laura said, my name is Anna Vanskoik. I am a reference librarian here at the Hopewell branch for the Mercer County Library System. And this evening's program, From Aspen Pink to Stony Brook, The Story of the Streams of Lawrence Township is presented by Dennis P. Waters. Dennis Waters is a visiting scientist in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Natural Resources at Rutgers University, where he studies the lichens of central New Jersey. He received a PhD in advanced technology from the Watson Engineering School in Binghamton, at Binghamton University. His book, Behavior and Culture in One Dimensions, Sequences, Affordances, and the Evolution of Complexity was published by Rutledge in 2021. He is a Mercer County Library Commissioner, as well as the former Lawrence Township historian. So thank you again for being here this evening. And Dennis, I'm gonna pass it off to you. Well, thank you, Anna, and thank you, Laura, and thank you, everyone, for turning out this evening. I'm going to endeavor to share my screen, and we'll see what happens here. I see you, but I hope it's nice to see me, and um, and uh, and glad to be here to talk about uh, the story of the streams of Lawrence Township. The uh, program this evening uh, co-sponsored with the Mercer County Library System and the Lawrence Township Environmental Education Foundation. Okay. Well, now I'm not able to get my slide to advance. Uh, try the lower oh. left-hand corner of your slide. There you go. Well, now something has changed. What has ha what has happened here? Okay, let's try this. You know, I love how these things always work so well in practice, and then as soon as we actually get to do them. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Scroll over to the lower left and you should see the arrows. Well, yeah, maybe I can try something on the keyboard. Let me see if that works. Yeah, there are, there is a shortcut. Well, no, that's not doing it either. Oh, it's a... You can either use the right arrow key or you could use the page down arrow. Yeah, let me see what I've got here. Ah, there you go. Something has happened. That's good. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is a new software for me. So um, anyway, so um, the history of Lawrence uh, in many ways is summed up uh, in a single word, which is between. We are between. New York and Philadelphia. We are between New Brunswick and Trenton or between Princeton and Trenton. But for this evening's purposes, our betweenness uh, centers on two great river systems, the Raritan River and the Delaware River. So the dividing line between the Delaware and Raritan watersheds uh, runs through several towns in Mercer County, primarily Hopewell, West Windsor, and Lawrence. So this brown line that you see here represents the divide in Mercer County. Everything up here flows to the Raritan River. Everything down here flows to the Delaware River. So our connection to the Raritan is via Stony Brook and the Millstone River system. And our connection to the Delaware is through several tributaries of the Assenpink Creek, which drains to the Delaware at Trenton. So to make sure we're all on the same page, I would like to start by reviewing the current geography so you get a sense of where these streams are and where they go, because a lot of times they're kind of invisible to us in our in our day to day existence. So we'll start with a simple one. This is Stony Brook. Stony Brook itself travels about two miles through Lawrence on its way from Hopewell to Princeton. 
and most of us encounter it only in the northern corner of town where it crosses Carter Road uh, right near the ETS campus. But the Stony Brook uh, drains an area of almost four square miles, including much of the higher elevations in the northern section of Lawrence, as well as part of the flat lowlands in the vicinity of Port Mercer, which is down behind uh, Mercer Mall and Nassau Park along the canal. Uh, we'll have a lot more to say about the Port Mercer area in a little while. Now, as far as I can tell, the Stony Brook has only ever had the one name over the years, and only the, the only spelling variation has been whether to insert an E before the Y in Stony. It's really the Assenpink and its tributaries that drain most of Lawrence. So they say Lawrence smiles for 22 miles, and that's 22 square miles. So if you take away the uh, the four miles of uh, Stony Brook, that leaves 18 square miles of Lawrence to be drained by the Assenpink. It doesn't flow through Lawrence, but for almost five miles of its total 25 mile length, the Assenpink forms the boundary between Lawrence and Hamilton, starting just below the dam that creates Mercer Lake and Mercer County Park, which is over here. So this entire border between Lawrence and Hamilton is, uh, is the Assenpink Creek. And we mostly encounter the Assenpink when we cross into Hamilton on Quaker Bridge Road or on Young's Road or on Whitehead Road. There are also less traveled crossings at Carnegie Road and at Basin Road. This use of the Assenpink as a civil boundary is as old as Lawrence itself. On February 20th, 1697, the Colonial Supreme Court at Burlington created the township of Maidenhead and defined its citizens as inhabitants north of the Assenpink. Then in 1714, when Hunterdon County was formed out of Burlington, once again, the Assenpink was chosen as the boundary between the counties until Mercer County was created in 1838. When you cross the Assenpink, you were leaving not just the township, but also the county. Now, the Assenpink has had several names and multiple spellings over the years. In colonial times, it was briefly known as the Derwent, which is also the name of an important river in the English Midlands. It has also been called the Saint Pink, apparently from a mishearing of Assenpink. But from the middle of the 19th century on, it has been the Assenpink, though subject to a lot of creativity and spelling. Now, the southern part of Lawrence is drained by the Shabakunk Creek, which originates in Ewing and in Hopewell. The Shabakunk also forms about a mile and a half of the border between Lawrence and Ewing. So all of this is a Shabakunk uh, separating Lawrence and Ewing. In Ewing, the Shabakunk has two main branches which join at the Lawrence border. The west branch flows north from Spruce Street to join the east branch, which flows down from the Eggert's Crossing Village area. The combined Shabakunk uh, then crosses 206 near Notre Dame, crosses Princeton Pike near the Lawrence Shopping Center, crosses Brunswick Avenue uh, near Colonial Lanes, and on the east side of Brunswick Avenue, the Shabakunk is dammed to create Colonial Lake. From there, it's mostly invisible, traveling under the Trenton Freeway and under the DNR Canal to join the Assenpink here. Like the Assenpink, the Shabakunk has been subject to a variety of spellings over the years, including several variations that include the word shabby. This uh, aerial photo shows its confluence with the Assenpink in more detail. It flows from Colonial Lake here, under the Trenton Freeway, under the DNR Canal, and then joins the Assenpink uh, down here, uh, just above the Elsa Wastewater Treatment Plant. The next tributary of the Assenpink that I'd like to discuss has the distinction of having two interchangeable and equally correct names. Even today, Five Mile Run and Little Shabakunk Creek. Depending on whom you ask and which map you look at, you could see either one. The official township map shows it as Five Mile Run, but many state and federal maps call it the Little Shabakunk. Either way, you can't go wrong. But to avoid confusion this evening, I shall call it Five Mile Run. Now, one branch of Five Mile Run begins in the woods, sometimes called the Five Mile Woods, along Bunker Hill Road behind 
Ryder University, and another branch starts further north near Sturwood Hamlet. At Ryder, it's dammed to form Centennial Lake, and then it crosses 206, just north of Dara Lane, then travels uh, through Turtleback Park along the edge of the Cobblestone Creek Golf Course to cross Princeton Pike, just south of Franklin Corner Road. It then more or less follows Stonaker Drive and crosses Route 1 near Allen Lane. It then travels under the DNR Canal and joins the Ass and Pink behind uh, worldwide floor coverings at the end of Dara Lane. Here's a little more detail on the confluence. So this is the intersection of the Trenton Freeway and Brunswick Pike. Uh, this is Allen Lane here. This is Carnegie Road. And you can see the, uh, you can see the five mile run following Stonaker. It crosses under the Trenton Freeway, travels a short distance, then crosses under the DNR Canal, and then joins the uh, Assen Pink down here. So this is about a mile upstream from where the uh, Shabakunk joins the uh, Assen Pink. But if Lawrence were to have a stream truly to call our own, it would have to be Shipatawkin Creek. Not only does the Shipatawkin drain almost half of the township's total area, but it also begins and ends in Lawrence. The Shipatawkin begins with two branches. One rises in the pole farm, travels through Village Park, and crosses Cold Soil Road near Bergen Street. The other rises in the Shipatawkin Woods off Carter Road and travels across Van Kirk Road. The streams merge near the old township quarry and the combined flow crosses Carter Road near the Cherry Grove Farm and then 206 at Fackler Road and Princeton Pike just north of Meadow Road. When the ship at Talkin encounters the DNR Canal, it turns to run parallel to the canal for about a mile following the canal under Route 1 near the I-95 or I-295 interchange. It crosses under the canal just north of Baker's Basin Road and parallels the canal for another half mile before joining the Ass and Pink just north of Carnegie Road. That's about two thirds of a mile upstream from Five Mile Run. <clears throat> In colonial times, the Shipatawkin was often known as Eight Mile Run, a usage that persisted into the early 20th century. If you're keeping track of the mileage, Five Mile Run is five miles from Trenton along today's 206, and Eight Mile Run is eight miles. Uh, here's some more detail on the canal crossing. This is Route 1 here in red, and this is the former Sleepy Hollow uh, Motel right here. So this is the ship of Talkin coming down parallel to the DNR Canal, and it joins another small tributary before it crosses under the canal right here. And then it's joined by Sand Run, which comes down this way and continues on down uh, to join the uh, Assen Pink uh, right here. A couple of quick notes on two smaller tributaries of the ship of Talkin. One is the sand run that I just mentioned. This stream is mostly invisible to us in our daily travels. It rises behind the motor vehicle station on Route 1 and travels under I-295 to join the Shipatawkin just after the Shipatawkin crosses under the canal. The other tributary of the Shipatawkin today has no generally recognized name, but historically has been called Six Mile Run, and you can imagine why. Uh, it rises in Lawrenceville Village and crosses 206 near Green Avenue, continues across the Lawrenceville School campus, where it is dammed to form the Lawrenceville Pond, and then joins the ship at Talkin just before the main channel crosses Princeton Pike. So, to review quickly, in the space of about two miles, we have the Shabakunk, Five Mile Run, and the ship at Talkin, all traveling under the DNR Canal through 19th century conduits and dumping into the Assen Pink. And if you've ever wondered why that area is so prone to flooding, this is part of your answer. Now, this map uh, shows the watersheds of the streams of Lawrence. These three at the top, the sort of greenish ones, um, are the Stony Brook watershed. This large tan area in the middle is Shipatawkin Creek. This pinkish area 
is five mile run and the rose color uh, represents the Shabakunk, including the section near Federal City Road. And this tiny little bit down here is uh, draining to the west branch of the Shabakunk. In early America, as now, the simplest and perhaps most iconic way of thinking about the streams of Lawrence is to visualize them where they cross Route 206, starting from the Trenton end. Now, this map dates to the end of the 18th century and shows the first proposed route of what is today a US-1 Brunswick Pike. On the old King's Highway through Maidenhead, we see the Shabakunk, uh, we see the Five Mile Run, we see the Eight Mile Run, and then Stony Brook, which by this time is over in Princeton. And this sequence of streams crossing the King's Highway was also found in Lawrence's most famous Revolutionary War episode, the run-up to the Second Battle of Trenton. There was a skirmish here at Eight Mile Run on January 1st, 1777, followed the next day by engagements at Five Mile Run, which is not depicted on this map, and again at Shabakunk Creek, Colonel Hand's famous rearguard action to slow the advance of Cornwallis toward Trenton. Thus, all three of Lawrence's main tributaries of the Ass and Pink saw action during those crucial days. So with that overview in hand, let's turn to a new topic. This is supposed to be a history talk, but in order to understand the history of the streams of Lawrence, we must turn the clock back much further to the time before history, meaning geologic time. As we will see, events that took place millions of years ago affected settlement patterns in Old Maidenhead and still affect the flow and behavior of our streams today. It's not widely appreciated, but geologists tell us that between two and five million years ago, what are now South and Central Lawrence were on the floodplain of a great prehistoric river called the Pensauken. How big was this river? Well, it connected today's Hudson Valley and Delaware Valley. So upstream, it was the forerunner of today's Hudson River, possibly even the Connecticut River as well. And downstream, it was the forerunner of today's uh, Delaware River south of Trenton. If you've ever wondered why the Delaware makes a 90 degree turn just south of Trenton, this is part of that story. So you have to close your eyes and imagine this vast river, perhaps bigger than today's Hudson or Delaware, surging across central New Jersey and right through Lawrence. At that time, there was also a precursor to today's Raritan River that flowed south and joined the Pensauken near Princeton and Kingston. So today's Main Street in Lawrenceville was right at the northwest edge of the floodplain of the mighty Pensauken. The small hill that you climb as you travel up Gordon Avenue or Cold Soil Road or Lawrenceville Pennington Road was just high enough to keep the water from rising any further. When the first glaciers arrived between one and two million years ago, this is the line of the glacier, glacial advance here, um, they blocked the Pensauken near New York. So the Hudson River found its present day channel and the great flow across central New Jersey was cut off. Local streams like the Millstone River established themselves in the old Pensauken Valley. But, and you have to use your imagination on this one too, the weight of the glacier, this huge pile of ice, thousands of feet thick, was sufficient to depress the crust of the earth, tilting the crust ever so slightly toward the north with the result that the Raritan and Millstone rivers began flowing north toward the glacier instead of south along the old channel. It doesn't take much of a change in angle to change the flow of water and the weight of the glaciers deformed the earth's crust just enough. As the glaciers came and went, the streams of the old Pensauken Plain repeatedly adjusted their courses. In fact, during the last two glaciations, about 25,000 and 150,000 years ago, the Earth's crust was so depressed by the ice to the north that part of the Delaware River began to flow northeast, traveling up what is today's Assin Pink Valley and spilling into the millstone near today's Port Mercer. It's shown on this diagram here. Here's the Delaware River coming down here, and part of it starts going up this way. 
So this is uh, this is Lawrenceville here. Here's Trenton. Princeton is up here. So this gives you a sense of where we are. And these blue arrows show the course of the old Pensalkin River traveling from northeast to southwest. The red arrows show the opposite flow of the Delaware River traveling up the Assin Pink and Millstone Valleys. Now, you know, historically in Europe and in Asia, there are many cities whose history is defined by repeated conquests, you know, armies advancing from different directions back and forth across the centuries. For much of Lawrence, this was the case as well, but instead of armies, we had water flowing south and then north and then south again, like sloshing back and forth in a big bathtub. So all of the flat wetland that makes up the great meadow of Maidenhead is a legacy of these flows. Another legacy of this ancient geology is the peculiar hairpin turn in Stony Brook, which flows south and east from Hopewell, and then makes this abrupt change and turns northeast toward the millstone at Port Mercer. Today, the boundary between the Delaware and Raritan watersheds in the Port Mercer area is subtle and not well defined. The elevation at Port Mercer is only 56 feet above sea level, which makes it a truly unusual watershed divide. When the first settlers arrived in Maidenhead, they found this great meadow, very wet with thick peaty soil. Even then, each year when the spring melt would engorge the Stony Brook, it would overflow its banks. And instead of flowing north toward the millstone, some of the water would enter the Delaware Valley via the Shipatawkin Creek. This description from the Moore and Jones Road Atlas published in 1804 summarizes. It says in part, about a mile from hence on the east side of the road is a patch of land of about 2000 acres called the Maidenhead Meadows a very valuable tract of the fenny kind. The soil is a rich black mold in many places six feet deep. Its fertility depends upon the spring freshets by which it is overflowed from Stony Brook. Since colonial times, the great meadow of Maidenhead has been subject to human manipulation. Already in the 18th century, the wetlands were being drained to create pasturage and farmland. The 1764 Act of the New Jersey Assembly allowed landowners in the Great Meadow to make these improvements. Early roads, such as Province Line Road, were built on raised causeways to keep them dry. It's thought that at least part of today's Province Line Road continues along the original causeway roadbed built back then. These causeways also had the effect of constraining the flow back and forth between the Shipatawkin and the Stony Brook. Princeton Pike, which was constructed in 1808, was also built on a raised causeway through the Great Meadow. But as you might imagine, the greatest human manipulation in the area came in the 1830s with the construction of the Delaware and Raritan Canal. The big picture here is that the canal takes advantage of the channel cut by the historic northward flow of the Delaware River. The canal is gravity fed from the Delaware at Trenton to the Raritan at New Brunswick. But this is a very gentle slope, a drop of only a few dozen feet over its entire length. This rather famous map of New Jersey created by Thomas Gordon in 1828 shows the extent of the great meadow of Maidenhead before the DNR Canal was built, but after the Brunswick and Princeton Pikes were constructed. So you can see the wetlands extending from the Stony Brook all the way down the Shipatawkin Creek, and also the extent of this wet area, almost everything between Princeton Pike and Brunswick Pike, and between Baker's Basin and Province Line Roads was included in the great meadow. We don't know in any detail how the construction of the canal affected the flows of the streams in the neighborhood. We do know that either as the canal was being dug or shortly thereafter, an earthen structure was built right along here that is today known as the Port Mercer Dyke. This structure emerges at a 90 degree angle from the west side of the canal towpath just south of Port Mercer. It seems to have been designed specifically to keep the Stony Brook from overflowing into the Shipatawkin, and it's been breached on numerous occasions during major floods 
uh, most recently with Hurricane Irene in 2011 and Hurricane Ida in 2021. To me, the most interesting question is to understand how construction of the canal affected the course of Shipitalkin Creek. We know that for about one and a half miles, uh, the canal and the creek flow side by side, basically for this entire stretch. And it's hard to believe this was an accident. The canal must have diverted the creek, but how did this happen? Richard Hunter has suggested, and it seems plausible to me, that the engineers who built the canal may have actually used the original Shipatawk stream bed for the canal. In other words, why dig a new ditch if there's already a ditch that goes more or less where you want to go? Under this scenario, the canal builders built the canal in the Shipatawk channel and then let the Shipatawk find its own way into a new channel, a new channel that had little choice but to parallel the old channel. And one of the most amazing things, just to remind you how flat and unusual the Great Meadow is, bear in mind that the flow of water in the DNR Canal is in this direction, from south to north, going toward the Raritan River. But the flow of water in the adjacent Shipatawkin Creek, right next door, is exactly the opposite, flowing from north to south. However, when there is a lot of water, the canal can be so overwhelmed that it actually starts flowing in the opposite direction toward Trenton, as it did with Hurricane Irene in 2011. So this is the 2015 FEMA floodplain map of Lawrence. The brown areas are the so-called 100-year floodplains. So you can see how the flood threat is settled, centered on the Shipatawkin Canal and Stony Brook Corridor which is the legacy of the great Pensauken River and the glaciers of so long ago. Today, almost 15% of the land surface of Lawrence Township is in a 100-year floodplain. The farmers who settled Maidenhead were dependent on streams to provide water for crops and for livestock. But here in the 21st century, we often forget that streams were also the only source of reliable power for operating mills. Farmer crops of wheat, corn, and buckwheat and rye were not of much value if there are no mills to grind grain into meal and flour. And rapid, inexpensive construction of buildings was only possible if a sawmill were available to turn logs into boards. The first mill in our area was Malon Stacy's Grist Mill on the Ass and Pink Creek in what is today Trenton. This dates to 1679. But the farmers of Maidenhead uh, getting to the mill in Trenton was a long and uncomfortable journey. And as a result, it did not take long for Maidenhead to get its own mills also on the Ass and Pink, but a little further upstream. We'll take a more detailed look at the Assin Pink Valley in a few minutes, but first I'd like to mention a second area with sustained mill activity, and that is along Stony Brook near what is today Carter Road. To the west was Hunt's Mill, originally built as a sawmill by Israel Hunt in 1787. In about 1800, Benjamin Titus bought the mill, and he added a grist mill. Through the 19th century, it went through several changes of ownership, as well as periods when it ceased operation for a time. This uh, 1849 map of Lawrence shows the name uh, Titus right here, and it also says G and S mills, meaning grist and sawmills. In this 1875 map, the mill is now in the hands of someone called Shepherd. And Van Kirk has built his distillery next door. Further downstream, almost to Province Line Road, was Golden's Mill, which came along after Hunt's and ceased operation sooner. In this 1930 aerial photo, you can see the mill pond for Hunt's Mill. And this is uh, Carter Road right here. In 1903, the mill had been purchased by another Hunt, Joseph Hunt who operated it until 1944. This photo is dated 1934 when it was the last mill operating in Lawrence Township. Uh, downstream is to the left and the mill race is, is here. 
This photo shows damage to the dam due to flooding in 1934. The dam was repaired by salvaging stone from the former Golden's Mill downstream, by which this time uh, it was no longer operating. In 1945, Joseph Hunt sold the mill to a man called Alfred Steele. Here's Alfred at the time of his wedding to the movie star Joan Crawford. He was the fourth of her four husbands. A little bit of Hollywood glam right here in Lawrence. Steele tore down the mill sometime before his death in 1949. There were also a couple of smaller mill operations, uh, one on the ship at Talkin Creek in this 1875 map, um, what is called coal soil, coal soil, on this map is actually what today we call Carter Road. This was the original alignment of Carter, which used to be a bit to the north of the current alignment near the uh, Glen Cairn uh, bed and breakfast. The mill was to the left of the old Carter Road, but would be to the right of the current Carter as you head away from 206. This 1800 map was used to lay out the route of the proposed uh, Princeton and Kingston branch turnpike, today's Princeton Pike. So this is Harney's Corner the intersection of 206 and Princeton Pike. This map shows a mill near the point uh, where the Shabakunk crosses 206. So this would be around uh, Notre Dame High School. We'll have a lot more to say about the ice business when we get to the ass and pink in a few minutes, but I should point out that in the late 19th century, a man called William Rouse harvested ice from this pond, which was then called Rouse's Pond, on the ship of Talkin to sell in Lawrenceville Village. This is in back of the Woodfield Estate subdivision near the alpaca farm on 206. And Rouse's house on 206 is a historic uh, landmark in Lawrence. But let's turn our attention to the major mill stream in Lawrence, the Assenpink, uh, shown here on the uh, historic land map of Lawrence. The Assenpink was a fine mill stream. There were five acid pink mills altogether <clears throat> in Windsor, in Lawrence Station, Whitehead Pond, East Trenton, right at the Lawrence border, and downtown Trenton. Thomas Gordon's Gazetteer of the State of New Jersey, published in 1834, reported that Lawrence had two sawmills and three grist mills. That would, included, that would have included Hunt's Mill on the Stony Brook. So this 1849 map of Lawrence shows the two major mill areas on the Assenpink, the Whitehead Pond, you can see the pond here with the dam down here, and the Lawrence Station Pond. And again, you can see the pond here and the dam is here. In colonial days, the mills were destinations for early road construction what we today call Franklin Corner Road, Baker's Basin Road, and Young's Road were laid out to the Lawrence Station Mill in 1760. What we today call Carr Avenue and Cherry Tree Lane were laid out to the Whitehead Pond in 1772. And yes, I can tell you that proofreading was not a strong suit of map makers in 1875. The first mill at what became Whitehead Pond was a grist and saw mill in 1770, established by John Phillips. There were mills on both the Maidenhead and Hamilton sides of the creek. The Whitehead brothers were operating a flour and paper mill on the Assenpink in 1852, when they began producing woolen goods as well. This was the first use of Whitehead Pond for industrial power. This mill manufactured uniforms for the Union during the Civil War. In 1870, they withdrew from the textile business and began producing rubber goods. A dam across the Assenpink created Whitehead Pond. You can see the pond and you can see the Assenpink uh, in this 19th century engraving. The artist took a few liberties. You can see this uh, ship's mast here in the distance. No telling what that's floating on. This 1890 Sanborn insurance map shows the setup. The dam was here. Uh, the main channel of the creek was here and the mill race was around here. This updated map in 1908 shows much the same layout, though with enlarged operations. Technically, the Whitehead operation was in Hamilton, but they owned and maintained the dam that created Whitehead Pond. 
1930 aerial photo shows the extent of Whitehead Pond with the Shabakunk joining the ass and pink right about here. This also shows the old alignment of Whitehead Road before the Trenton Freeway was built. This was its infamous dead man's curve uh, before it turned and crossed the canal here at Cherry Tree Lane. So this was the Whitehead Dam, and this was the factory in the 1930s. By this time, the good old rubber company had acquired the Whitehead Enterprise. Uh, this is the dam here, and uh, this is the main channel of the Ass and Pink, and the mill race is down here. I'll have more to say about the Whitehead Pond in just a bit. I will now turn our attention to what was for many decades, far and away, the largest body of water in Lawrence. And that was the Barenberg Ice Pond at Lawrence Station, which covered 17 acres. This area around Young's Road and Lawrence Station had been the site of milling activity going back to the earliest days of the township. This map from 1789 shows the area around what was then called John Phillips and Jacob Green's grist mill. You can see that a large pond was already in place at this time. This mill lasted until about 1800, when a new one was built further downstream with more capacity. John Reed built the last grist mill here in 1855, as the area became more of a crossroads. Each new mill incorporated the latest improvements in mill technology. To give you an idea of the extent of the whole operation, this is approximately where the pond would have been, occupying most of the area between Lawrence Station Road and the railroad tracks, and between Young's Road and the point where the tracks cross the Assenpink. So this was the dam at the Barenberg Ice Pond, and this shot uh, shows the spillway. This would have been in the early 1920s. But it was the ice making business that was the most remarkable feature of the site. This was the factory and warehouse for producing and storing the ice. The ice plant was owned by a man from Trenton called John W. Barenberg, who purchased the land in 1897. Barenberg was the youngest of several brothers, all of whom were in what was then called the natural ice business to distinguish it from machine made ice, artificial ice. Artificial ice was the AI of its time. The shallow pond would freeze each winter. The ice was harvested and sold within Mercer County, but the site had 1,200 feet of frontage on the Pennsylvania Railroad tracks, which also allowed the ice to be shipped to Newark and to New York. Barenberg employed 50 transient workers each winter, plus 50 farm boys as day laborers. Here you see them scraping the snow to expose the ice underneath. And here they are cutting the ice into blocks that are being carried up the conveyor to the warehouse. The pond produced 35,000 tons of ice each season with a value of about $750,000 in 1920. That translates to about $11 million in 2023. During the peak of the shipping season, the plant would fill and dispatch 20 freight cars filled with ice every day. And to keep the ice blocks from sticking to one another, they were scored with a crosshatch pattern, and this produced this enormous pile of ice flakes. Local historian Roscoe Howell, whose family operated the grist mill during its last years, put together this map showing the area during its heyday. Here's the pond, here are the railroad tracks. The natural ice business was eventually driven out of business due to refrigeration. Consumers became skeptical that natural ice was any better than artificial ice. Barenberg began moving his operation to Trenton in 1916 and completed the move in 1920. The complex at Lawrence Station operated until 1926, when the dwindling ice business could no longer support maintenance of the dam. The pond was, as they say in the dam business, dewatered in late 1931, and soon thereafter the dam was dismantled by workers of the WPA. Eventually the railroad closed the Lawrence Station, 
the construction of I-295 and the high-level Young's Road Bridge over the Ass and Pink and the railroad tracks have largely obscured the landscape of a century ago. The only remaining structure is the Mount's Mill House, which dates to 1770. One interesting footnote, in the 1960s, Roscoe Howell enlisted the help of the fifth grade shop class at Lawrence Intermediate School to build a scale model of the old ice plant. So you can see that happening here. Here is the pond, the railroad tracks over here. Um, it was unveiled with great ceremony. Unfortunately, today, no one knows what became of it. Historians typically, or maybe stereotypically, think of streams and waterways as being very important for very practical reasons, grist mills, sawmills, transportation, industrial power. But that does not mean that streams have no other role in the life of a community. Streams offer many forms of recreation, as well as adding to the beauty of the landscape. So for a few minutes, let's turn our attention to these less practical uses of the streams of Lawrence. Earlier, we talked about the Whitehead Pond in the context of industry, but if Lawrence ever had an all-purpose body of water, Whitehead Pond would be it. Here, you can see it in an aerial photograph from 1930. Here's the rubber factory and the dam and the main channel of the Assin Pink and the mill race. This is the DNR Canal over here. This is Colonial Lake. And here's the Assin Pink looking upstream and it's uh, joined uh, by the Shabakunk emerging from a colonial lake to cross under the canal. In the 20th century, Whitehead Pond was a swimming hole, a popular fishing spot, a place to ice skate in the winter, even a place for boating. Plus, it was a little piece of nature on the industrial border between Lawrence and Hamilton. This is the spillway of the dam seen from the Hamilton side in about 1940. And this is the view looking upstream from the top of the pond. And this is looking even further upstream on the Shabakunk as it enters the Assin Pink. If you can make out this water tower here, this was from the old Lawrence Hose Company a rubber plant. So here are some canoeists and boaters. It looks like they were at the entrance to the mill race on uh, Whitehead Pond. This would be uh, today's Sweetbriar Avenue over here. The biggest change to Whitehead Pond came in the early 1950s with the construction of the Ewing Lawrence Sewer Authority plant along the western shore. But much of the old dam remained in place until the late 1990s when the bridge over the Ass and Pink was replaced. You can see, still see the dam here. These photos were taken in 1979 when there was already concern about the stability of this dam. Here you can see some rubble that is washed away from the dam. Over the years, the Whitehead Dam has been lowered several times, reducing the level of the pond. And in 1998, the bridge with the old mill race was replaced. The result today is much less of a pond than a wide spot in the Assin Pink. There's still a little drop here at uh, what remains of the dam. And this is all that is left today of that big Whitehead Dam. A quick word about fishing. The idea of stocking streams with fish for recreational purposes took off in the early 20th century. New Jersey began stocking streams on a large scale in 1912. In Lawrence, initially the stocking was combined to Stony Brook and Ass and Pink Creek. Later, it was expanded to include Colonial Lake, Whitehead Pond, and of course the DNR Canal. Whitehead Pond was a popular fishing spot, as was an area off Young's Road near the former Berenberg Ice Pond. This area was done away with when the high-level bridge was constructed over the Ass and Pink and the railroad tracks in 1962. One of the oldest ponds in town is also one of the least visible. This is the pond at the Lawrenceville School, which was created in 1829 along the six-mile run tributary of Shippetalkin Creek. This 1875 map shows Six Mile Run originating in a spring near today's Green Avenue and Bergen Street. This is the Lawrenceville Pond. A hundred years ago, this island in the middle served as a stage for traveling theater groups with the audience seated on the shore in a grandstand. The dam creating the pond uh, is over here. This photo is from the late 1920s. 
This is an earlier generation of that dam. The winter freezing of the pond provided ice for refrigeration and also recreation for the students. Starting in 1896 and continuing for several decades, the hockey team used it for practice. And students were also allowed to join in pick up hockey games in lieu of taking their regular gym class. I say the pond was created, but founding headmaster Isaac Van Arsdale Brown didn't just contact the local landscaping service. He assembled the students, gave them shovels, and told them to start digging. The purpose of digging the pond was to provide a source of water in case of a fire at the school, a purpose that was fulfilled exactly once when the old gym was destroyed by fire in December of 1959. This shows the pond around 1920. But the most audacious attempt to harness a stream for recreation in Lawrence was the brainchild of Benjamin Miller, proprietor of the Colonial Land Development Company. In 1917, Colonial had already developed Colonial Heights, the area east of Brunswick Avenue and south of Cherry Tree Lane. In 1923, Miller was ready to move north and create Colonial Lakelands, a new housing subdivision centered on a private lake, which he proposed to create by damming the Shabakunk Creek. Colonial Lake was to provide a full range of recreational amenities, swimming, fishing, and boating. Prior to Miller's arrival, the Shabakunk looked like this. In 1923, Miller set about constructing a 500-foot dam across the Shabakunk to create Colonial Lake. Unfortunately, he neglected to inform the state of New Jersey that he was doing this. And when the state got wind of it, they sent out a team of inspectors who documented a number of deficiencies. And the following year, the dam failed. You can see here where it had already uh, begun to wash out. Then in 1925, it failed again. The upshot was that the dam needed to be substantially rebuilt. So here you see the beginning of the reconstruction. Colonial Lake became quite popular, not only for the residents of the subdivision, but also for everyone else in town. Miller eventually had to issue what were the equivalent of beach tags to keep non-residents away from what was then a private lake. The underprivileged had to make do with the nearby Whitehead Pond. That rebuilt dam survived another 20 years, but during the Second World War, it began to deteriorate again. In 1945, almost 200 residents of Colonial Lakelands petitioned Lawrence Township and the state of New Jersey to force Colonial to again rebuild the dam. Miller attempted to transfer ownership of the dam and the lake to the local homeowners group, the Colonial Lakeland Civic Association, but they wouldn't take the bait. As a result, he had to foot the bill to completely rebuild the dam. So this is the second Colonial Lake Dam, circa 1945. Finally, in 1955, Colonial managed to hand off the dam and the lake to the then Colonial Lakelands Lakedale Civic Association, which quickly realized it could not afford to maintain the property. Ten years later, in 1965, Lawrence Township agreed to acquire the lake and the dam and to take responsibility for their ongoing maintenance. This was a decade in which Lawrence used state green acres funding to acquire, to acquire land for most of the parks that exist today. Colonial Lake Park was part of that package. So this was the Colonial Lake Dam in the early 1970s. A new housing subdivision was built along the North Shore, which meant that the lake was almost completely surrounded by homes. However, by the late 1970s, the 1945 dam was becoming structurally unsound. So in 1979, the dam was once again rebuilt from scratch. So this here is dam version 3.0. The township made a brief run at getting the state DEP to take over the dam in 1995, but was unsuccessful. And the lake itself has been dredged and redredged many times over the years. The next lake to be created from scratch in Lawrence appeared on this farm off Route 206 in the late 1950s. Centennial Lake on the brand new Ryder College campus 
was created by damming Five Mile Run and incorporating several small underground streams. Since then, it has become a popular campus feature and the site of the annual Township Independence Day fireworks display. About 15 years later, the last significant man-made lake to be built in Lawrence was created by damming a tributary of Shippetalkin Creek on the new Squibb campus. The dam for this lake is actually the uh, roadway that connects the entrance on 206 to this parking lot around this side. You've probably noticed this by now, but it's worth pointing out specifically that there are no naturally occurring lakes or ponds of any size in Lawrence. Every one that we either have or have had was created by damming one of our streams. Streams and flooding have gone hand in hand since recorded history began. And these days it's the periodic floods that bring us all face to face with the streams of Lawrence Township. But before I take a look at the ancient plague of flooding, I would like to briefly discuss a more modern issue, and that is water pollution. Of course, people have been dumping sewage into streams since time immemorial, but this only became a problem with the growth of cities and increased population density. It was not until after the Second World War that suburban growth in Lawrence made wastewater treatment a municipal priority. The Ewing Lawrence Sewer Authority was created in the late 1940s, and its plant on Whitehead Pond began operation in the early 1950s. However, the worst pollution episodes in Lawrence have come in the form of spills, occasional dumping of large quantities of toxins. Here we see dead fish being hauled out of Whitehead Pond after a chemical spill on Five Mile Run in 1972. Pollution first started to become a problem here during prohibition, when operators of illegal stills would occasionally dump their products and byproducts into a stream. This report from 1933 tells of a still upstream in Monmouth County that devastated the fish population in the acid pink all the way down to Lawrence. And this tells of a man called Carlisle, who was shocked, shocked, to learn that someone was operating a still on his farm and dumping alcohol into the Stony Brook, resulting in the deaths of thousands of fish. In 1967, the state of New Jersey announced it would cut back on stocking trout in the ass and pink because the water had become too acid for most species to survive. Fortunately, federal and state clean water legislation starting around 1972 has improved the average quality of waterways across the country. Unfortunately, floods are not so easy to legislate. We've already talked about the regular flooding that took place in the Great Meadow of Maidenhead when water from the Stony Brook spilled over to the ship of Talkin. All of the streams in town no doubt flooded periodically, but these floods were little noted by farmers who were usually sensible enough to build their homes on high ground. We do know that the dams and mills on the Ass and Pink and Stony Brook were occasionally damaged by floods. But like pollution, flooding became a more general problem as housing densities increased and subdivisions began to be built on floodplains. The increase in what engineers call impervious surface also caused rainfall to flow directly into streams rather than be absorbed by the soil. Today, almost 15% of the land surface of Lawrence Township is in a 100-year floodplain. And in case you're wondering what that definition means, it is not that a flood will occur once every 100 years, but rather that there is a 1% chance of such a flood every year. Records of major floods along the Assin Pink go back to the 19th century. Trenton's so-called greatest flood ever took place in 1882, and the first gauge to monitor the height of the Assin Pink was installed at Trenton's Chambers Street Bridge in 1923. But it was not until after the Second World War that the flood threat started to become a serious problem in Lawrence. 1955 was a memorable year as Hurricanes Connie and Diane struck one week apart. But by the time Hurricane Doria rolled in in 1971, the population of Lawrence had more than doubled from less than 10,000 to almost 20,000. 
This shows flooding at the Westgate Apartments off 206 along the Shabakunk. And this is the Lawrence Shopping Center in 1971. The Shabakunk runs along the southern edge of that property. Doria dumped seven and a half inches of rain on the area in a 24 hour period. So here we see drivers stranded along Route 1. This is Whitehead Pond and the Elsa Wastewater Treatment Plant. Doria was a wake up call, but the alarm went off again four years later. The flood of July 1975 was not caused by a hurricane, but rather a series of torrential thunderstorms over a period of about two weeks. On July 20th and 21st, over six inches of rain fell in just 10 hours, and this was classified as a 500-year flood. This was the Trenton Freeway overpass at Whitehead Road, and some intrepid semis trying to negotiate the water. But of course, the flood we all remember most clearly was just 10 years ago, and that was Hurricane Irene, which dumped almost eight inches of rain on the area and again turned Route 1 into a river. This was Sweetbriar Avenue along the Assen Pink on the Hamilton side. The streams of Lawrence Township continue to have their way with us despite decades of flood control efforts. Most recently, Hurricane Ida in the fall of 2021, which did not equal Irene's damage, at least not in Mercer County, but still managed to shut down Route 1. And this is Franklin Corner Road along Five Mile Run during uh, in the aftermath of Ida. In the early 1960s, the Soil Conservation Service of the USDA proposed a major flood control program for the Assen Pink watershed. This entailed building dams across the Assen Pink itself and along some of its more troublesome tributaries. Many of these proposed dams were upstream from Lawrence or in other townships. Uh, for us today, perhaps the most significant artifact of this program is the dam across the Assen Pink that created Mercer Lake in Mercer County Park. And it is also the source of the still somewhat contentious Dam Site 21 over in Hamilton. But the Soil Conservation Service did propose two dams for Lawrence, called Dam 7 and 7A, both on the Shipatawkin Creek. Dam 7 would have been off Carter Road, just north and west of US 206. It would have created a four acre pond on what is now the Cherry Grove Organic Farm. Dam 7 got immediate pushback from the owners of the property involved. They argued that the benefits of this dam were minimal compared with the damage it would cause. And in 1977, Dam 7 was eventually dropped from the plan. But Dam 7A was another story. This dam would have been on the flat ground of the of the Maidenhead Meadows near the Shipatawkin Bridge on Princeton Pike, not far from the old Princessville Inn. It would have created an even larger pond of about 11 acres, which was envisioned as a possible recreation site. Again, the landowners objected, but work on this plan continued on and off for another 25 years. Finally, it too was abandoned, but not until 2001. Lawrence Township had declined to sponsor the project, and it was deemed uneconomical. I wish I could tie this all out with some good news about flood control in the future, but as Irene and Ida have demonstrated, it is a problem a long way from solution. But it is a problem that has been studied extensively. There are shelves full of reports talking about flooding in and around Lawrence and the Assen Pink. Uh, in the acid pink watershed. It's, uh, if there's any lesson here, it's that water has been sloshing back and forth across Lawrence for millions of years and this century is no different. So with that, I would like to say thank you to the many individuals who helped me with the research for this uh, program. And I would also like to say thank you to the Mercer County Library System and the Lawrence Township Environmental Education Foundation for, uh, for their sponsorship. And I guess we'll uh, we'll take some questions out of the chat now. Thank you so much, Dennis. I I always love your presentations and just how you augment the research with your um, your visuals, the picture, the photographs, the maps, um, everything. It's just it's such a an educational uh, evening, no matter what. 
Uh, I do want to encourage anybody who do has who do if they have any questions to please enter them into the chat. I do have some that came in while you were talking, Dennis. If we wanted to go ahead and kind of tackle a few of these that came through, I will do my best. Okay. <laughs> Um, one of the questions in the very beginning, you were talking about the creeks and how they uh, would run under the DNR canal. How would they, how, I guess, how were they running under the canal? Well, there were uh, conduits that were built uh, at the time the canal was built uh, for each of these streams. And uh, they're culverts. And if you go out and walk on the uh, DNR canal towpath, uh, you will see them if you, if you look. It doesn't, they're, they're there. There's one that goes back to the uh, very beginning of the canal, which is the one that the Shippetalkin Creek uh, flows under, uh, but it's usually, it's usually kind of full of junk, uh, so it's hard to see. But some of the, the other ones, I think the, sh the uh, five mile run one is, is, pretty, is pretty obvious if you, uh, if you look for that. All right, thank you. And then you might have alluded to this just with how the area is, but someone asked about when Quaker Road was built, was was there something more that could have been done to prevent it from flooding or was it just was the engineering not there? Well, I mean, uh, Quaker Quaker Road, uh, if we're talking about Quaker Bridge, oh, Quaker Road in, in uh, on the Princeton side, is that what you're talking about? It, it is, says Quaker Road. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking he's talking about, or they're talking about, yeah. Road, which, which, uh, which runs right along Stony Brook. Uh, if you remember the slide showing the uh, the hairpin curve in Stony Brook, well, Quaker Road runs right between those two, uh, right down the middle of that. And so it is, it is and, and was not built, uh, it was not built on a causeway, so it was not built high. So that is just, uh, there's nothing that could be done about it. That would have to be completely rebuilt in order to uh, stop from flooding. Okay, thank you. And then there was someone who was saying that they live near um, Shabakunk Creek, near Route 1, over past to Colonial Lake. Why are so many pieces of pottery on the riverbank? Um, the... Um... There are uh, that was a that was a disposal area for um, for some of the potteries in Trenton. They would the stuff that they made that was broken and not of any use was uh, was disposed of there. Um, I'm I'm drawing a blank on which pottery that was. There may be someone who's watching who will remember what that is and can stick it in the stick it in the chat. But I'm uh, I'm drawing a blank on that at the moment. But that is it was, that's where it that was comes. Wenzel. Wenzel, very good. Thank you. That was our other historian here with us this evening, Lauren <laughs> Ross. <laughs> um, someone was very, they're very glad you talked about Colonial Lake. I guess it's the um, centennial year next year. Yes, is that that's right. right. It is. It is. Okay. 1923, um, 2023. Excellent. And so he, he was talking about that as a child, he lived near Colonial Lake and he canoed along the Shabakunk. Um, and he was even able, or I think it was a, this person was even able to go through the tunnels under Business Route 1 and the DNR oh, wow. Canal down to the S and Pink. That must have been a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is just kind of a fun question because you were showing the skating earlier and there really are no more, there's really no more outdoor skating in Lawrence, is there? Um, I, it's, it's things hardly freeze over anymore, but I'm not aware well, of any outdoor skating. Yeah, that's I'm kind of what of I was any. thinking, this, especially with this past year. And then someone asks, um, right, this is a dude, I have to read it. I generally think of creek streams starting at high elevation. Dumb question perhaps, but how do the creeks in Lawrenceville originate? Is it just that rain gathers and then heads downhill before you know it? We have S and Punk or Five Mile, et cetera. Or are there, oh, or is there an underground uh, resource of some type? Uh, there are underground streams. Uh, I don't know too much about them or how well they have been mapped. I know there is, uh, if, if going north of Hopewell, there is, there is a stream that starts up on the Sauerland Mountain and, uh, and goes underground for quite some distance uh, heading, heading uh, south from there. Um, I know that there, there are springs. Uh, the ground is very wet in some areas, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's some underground streams, but I don't really know where they are. And then I have, we had talked in the beginning about how we're recording a series of these. So we have them for in um, archives for people to use later. 
And someone was asking about, um, and I think this is a presentation you're going to be giving, uh, about the oldest road in America from Trenton at the waterfalls to Raritan Route 27 and Route 206 now that link, we're linking the Dutch colonies. Is that the presentation that you'll be giving in October? That's correct, yes. So there, you have just it's called, made... It's called uh, Get Your Kicks on Route 206. So you have just made some uh, <laughs> some participants very happy because I had a few requests asking about whether that, that would be a program that you would be offering. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in, but again, I do want to thank the Lawrence Township Environmental Education Foundation for co-sponsoring this event with us this evening. Uh, Dennis, thank you so much for such an informative discussion. Uh, I want to thank Laura, who was behind the scenes, making sure everything was running smoothly. And everyone, I hope you have a lovely evening and thank you again for coming. We just had one question come in. Oh, uh, when you talk you, about streams flowing up north, is it because of the landform instead of gravity? Oh. Uh, well, the, the it's always because of the landform. Well, the landform and plus gravity is what makes it happen. So streams do flow downhill. Um, so, uh, uh, but 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 the particularly in the time of the glaciation, um, the uh, the glaciers are so heavy and they caused the, the crust of the earth to sink. And that actually changed the, uh, changed what, how to define downhill. So the downhill became the opposite direction. So the stream started flowing that way. Thank you so much. And thank you, Laura. She always has my back. So I don't always see the questions coming in. So again, once this uh, recording is available, we will mail it out to all the registrants. And again, I wanna thank everybody and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.